Well, it's great to have, I see a lot of returning faces uh, and some new faces as well, so that's awesome. So again, I'm so happy to have our community here in New York. And just to let you know a little bit about more about Adventures with Agile, uh, we are a company and um, we're very mission-led. We're community first and our mission is making working lives better. And that determines how we do everything from our communities to our training courses uh, to the free resources that we offer online. Again, thank you to Barclays. And just to let you know, our next upcoming course is the Agile Team Facilitator which is accredited through IC Agile. It's the first time we've actually run this in the States. Uh, it's a two-day course, and it's uh, one of the two courses that you need within the whole Agile coaching track uh, within IC Agile, and then you can go for Agile Expert. And for being our lovely community members, there's a $100 discount here with this uh, tag code. Yeah, you can't use two codes spelled. <laughs> But yeah, so also to let you know that we, we do run our courses internationally and we have them based on agile coaching, but also enterprise level agile coaching, but we are community first. And that's actually how I met Ben Williams, who's one of the speakers today through our community. So you were first coming to our ones in London. Were you there at the very first one? Uh, probably, I think so. Yeah, so four years ago, he's at the very first when I Adventures with Agile began. We started as a meetup group and then we grew into a company. And so if you go to our YouTube channel, We've got videos of all of our speakers across London, and we now have some good cameras and tech here, so we're going to be recording from New York as well. So, yeah, we're so excited. If you have any questions about the community or any of our courses, please let me know. So I'm just about to introduce our... You get three speakers, three for the price of one. It's pretty good tonight. Um, and I'm very excited to learn more about integral theory. I've only scratched the surface myself, and the little bit I've done I find very very useful just using the four quadrants as a kind of analysis tool to understand what's going on around me, but I'm sure you're going to learn a lot more tonight. So I'm going to hand you over to Ben, Lior, and Alana. Okay, so a little bit about us before we begin. Um, we are Integral Agile. Um, we, in a general sense, feel very strongly that there's a magic that happens, and I think you, you, if you're here, you've probably experienced at some point where um, a scrum team or a Kanban team, depending on the problems they're solving, really start to come together. And they have that experience of camaraderie, and, and you can see what they are before, and you can feel what it's like after. And that, that works, and that works very well. And in the various different scaling frameworks, um, that, that is typically described as the foundational level or the team level. Um, so, one of the things that we thought about when we got together is we've all had experience scaling Agile, and there are a lot of different ways to scale Agile. Um, and sometimes it works pretty well, and sometimes it works a little bit differently, but one thing that we all internally agreed upon, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this, is you have approaches that are very process heavy. You have approaches that are very not that. Um, and achieving that same level of magic, that same level of the lights turning on at scale, is still something that's eluding us to some degree. So the idea behind integral is uh, to take everything, to take the, the best knowledge that we have to offer, and then we could be talking about any industry. Obviously, we're talking about Agile today. But the idea is to take the best of what the world has to offer, and then apply every tool we have at our disposal towards the problem we have at hand, agnostic of the framework of the approach. And that's what we're on. So my name is Lior. Um, I am an enterprise coach. I'm currently engaged in American Express. Um, before I became an enterprise coach, I was a regular coach, team coach. Before that, I was a scrum master. Before that, I was a graphic designer. Um, and before that, I was a fine artist. So for me, taking um, an artist's approach to agile problems is what inspires me. Uh, I'm Alana Finn. I'm currently a scrum master at Nerdlight. Um, 
like Leor, I have an interesting past. I was originally from, I did some reality TV production, then I did uh, local TV journalism at New York One, which is a local TV station. If you guys are from New York, you know that station. Um, and then I did some time at a PR firm for real estate and real estate technology companies. So that is how I got here today. And a lot of what I've learned uh, working out in the field in journalism and working in real estate technology actually translates quite well into the world. Uh, I'm Ben Williams, uh, as you can probably tell I'm not local, although I am local now, I live uh, in New York City. Uh, originally from the UK and most recently in the UK in, in London before moving here. Uh, I was uh, in the finance domain, uh, so I was in operations and middle office and front office before I moved over to help tech teams deliver better, I don't know, quicker, faster. Um, and since then, I have done a bunch of engagements, mostly in, uh, in finance tech, but other startups as well. Um, and now I find myself in New York, surrounded by a fantastic community, um, very similar, in fact, to the community in London. So uh, it's very nice to be here. Awesome. So this is my slide. Uh, I just want to take a moment to set the energy in the room because I'm a scrum master and I come to the table with a lot of energy, which could be a lot for my team at 9 in the morning, but it's not 9 in the morning now. So I just want to give us a round of applause for being here today. We just, we made it. We didn't have to be here, but we are here because we care about this stuff, right? So, and I'm really excited. So I have a lot of energy warning you guys now. So we are going to take a temperature of the room right, right now to get to know you guys a little better. So hands up if you are a coach, a team member, uh, a manager or a product owner? Hands up. All right. Okay, great. So hands up if you are currently working on or with Agile teams. Hands up. All right, now keep those hands up if you have more than six months of experience. 12 months, 18 months, two years, three years, five years, 10 years. How many years? All right. Okay. Cool. All right. So, um, so uh, for those of you who are here today, who was here for the last ad, uh, Adventures with Agile meetup with Antoinette on the seven myths of organizational agility? Okay. Great. Now, of those of you who did not attend that meetup, how many of you are familiar with integral theory? Okay. We're gonna learn something today. Uh, and how many of you here are familiar with the term teal organization? All right, just started yesterday, okay. All right, great. Um, all right, next slide. So now that we know each other a little bit better, we know who we are, we know who you are, um, we're gonna take a look at integral theory today. Obviously, that's sort of here, you guys know that. Um, but just a warning, integral theory is an enormous topic. This is something that cannot be covered in just one night. But what we've done is we've curated the content to meet what we think would be the needs of this group and what would be the most beneficial for you guys. Then after taking a look at integral theory, we're going to take a look at current frameworks and practices that we use today and see where they might be lacking when it comes to agile transformation and how we can use integral theory to unlock that holistic perspective that is really needed for meaningful and impactful transformation. And then we're going to move on to our group activity where we're going to go from the theoretic level and bring it down to the real life application of integral theory. And then last, we're going to leave you guys with a gift bag of a few actionable items that you can take with you if you were to use integral theory as soon as you walk up to the uh, Okay, so um, I imagine that a lot of you have seen something that looks like this. So this is the uh, version one, 12th State of Agile Report 2018. Um, and really, we've used this slide here to, to tell two things. One, we're not here to do Agile. And I think sometimes we need a little reminder that the goal is not to do Agile, it's not to implement a framework. Um, also, what we're highlighting here is that no matter how good we are at our jobs as coaches, and no matter how much money and time we have invested, into um, doing Agile. Uh, we, according to the survey, say that 84% of us are still maturing. So we still have not hit the promises of 
uh, of better quality and faster and cheaper that Agile might um, promise us. So 84% are still not at that level. So if it's not about doing Agile, what is it about? And again, I think a lot of you will have seen stats like this in the past. So uh, 50 years ago, a top company would last 75 years. Now, 14 years. So our, our best performing companies, on average, stay in that top tier for only 14 years. Which means, in the next 10 years, half of that uh, uh, Fortune 500, half of that will turn over in the next 10 years. So, we're in Barclays at the moment. I've worked at uh, Bank of America and JP Morgan and a few others. There are lots of other well-established companies as part of this index, but established successful companies. How do we make sure we are in the right 50%? How do we make sure that we will continue to be successful past that 10 years? And the, real, the way we really think we're going to be able to do this is if we are able to disrupt the industry while remaining uh, consistent with our company. So how can we disrupt our old business model with a new business model? So positive disruption you hear banded around quite a lot. So how do we find new revenue streams how do we steal revenue streams from our old business lines within our company um, rather than someone from outside of our company stealing business from our old business lines? So we feel like an integral perspective is the key. So just to give a brief history of integral, um, a remarkable development has taken place over the last 40 years where the, the whole of the world's cultures are now available to us. It used to be 50 years ago, 100 years ago, you grew up someplace in the world and that's what you knew, unless you had the means to travel, in which case you could experience a few different cultures. Um, but I'm sure anyone who spent enough time in New York has seen um, just the experience you have ordering lunch, right? You can order basically anything from any cuisine in the world right here. So there's, there's, a, there's a wealth of gifts and there's a wealth of flavors that various cultures in the world have made available to us. On top of that, with the internet and with information being available to us at, at, at our fingertips, this is not an exaggeration, the entirety of documented human knowledge is now available to us. Um, that's pretty crazy. So people started piecing these things together and they started trying to look at, well, various groups in this area, they, they, they have a really interesting perspective, and this area has an interesting perspective, but they looked at it from the lens of what's always true, right? So a particular group might have an idea about doing things a certain way. It could be any, again, any field. It could be the medical field. It could be you know, astrophysics. It could be sports, and maybe they have a better way of training, right? Um, so they started to, to look at everything from a holistic perspective and say, well, how can we take the best of everything that they have to offer and combine that into a whole to take the best of what the world's cultures and knowledge have available and to synthesize that into a few easy, and I, I say easy, and, and what we're going to do after this is I'm going to go into a couple because to Alana's point, Trying to go through integral in one sitting is just an exercise in, in getting a headache. Um, so we're going we're gonna to briefly describe a couple of the ideas to you. And we're going to go deeply into one of them. But the idea to get across here is, and you, you've got some handouts um, that actually have the majority of integral theory on them. And it's, it's very high level stuff. But we wanted you to be able to leave, to, to have something that you could reference and that you could look up later on at your own leisure. So the idea behind it is, how can we take these things and put them into models that are evolving and that will continuously evolve, but something where we can create distinctions? So that I can have a, I can have a conversation with you, for example, and we could talk about one of these things, or two of these things, or three of these things, and say, how does that make sense to me in my life as a human? 
How does that make sense to my family and my relationships? How does that make sense to my colleagues at work? And what are some of the things that these can tell us that could potentially inform us as to why the earlier slide that showed, you know, Agile came out in 2001. So we're 18 years down the road, and we're still looking at about 84% still trying to get to that maturity level. Um, I referenced earlier, if you're in this room, you've probably had at least one Agile success, and you know what that feels like. And you've probably had multiple Agile not successes. Um, not necessarily a failure, but not that highest echelon of where everyone just goes home from work, like, I can't believe that this thing happened, I'm feeling so good about this, that, or the other. And the unfortunate truth there is that doesn't always last, right? I, I can say from personal experience, places where I've been engaged, where everything was humming like a well-oiled machine, and I checked back in with the client two years later, and some of the places have kind of held on to it, but they're, it's not all the way. So what is it that is unraveling that? What is it that is not allowing that change to be sustainable? Um, so our, our hypothesis is that there are things going on that we're not addressing, that we're not seeing. And that's what integral theory is all about. So taking these integral theories and actually crisscrossing them with Agile, and we're, we're completely in the inquiry right now. Right? So we're saying we're going to try some of these things, we're going, to, we're going to try some of those things. Here's the full wealth of knowledge that we have from an agility perspective, but I think we can all agree that we still have a lot to grow. So the first aspect of integral theory is the most accessible, I think. Um, and this is called a whole lot. So we're all made up, you know, the, the I have here the building block of the whole lot being the atom. But we're all aware that atoms are comprised of subatomic uh, uh, particles, right? So we know about the electrons, the protons, neutrons, so on and so forth. Um, but that being said, we're trying to keep this simple. So atoms go on to form molecules, which go on to form the cells in our bodies, which go on to form organs. Organs form systems, our circulatory system, pulmonary system, respiratory, all that. Eventually, we get up to an individual. And then we form teams. And that's, that was the crux of Scrum and Kanban when it first came out, right? But what happens now? Well, now we have to scale. Now we're in large organizations. So now we're going to get into teams of teams. And that's where things get a little bit complicated. Because now we're dealing with groups between 50 to 150 people. How do we keep that feeling of cohesion and togetherness? Um, you know, again, we've all had the experience of that one or two team members that it's really hard to turn over and get them to embrace the collaborative spirit. Now we're trying to do that on a larger level. And then what happens when we get to an organization? Right? So now it's even more difficult. Now we've got leaders, senior leaders, who may or may not be on board. And they have their own reasons for not being on board. So how do we get them on board? Right? We speak to them from their perspective. We say, what are the things that you need? And then obviously, you know, organizations are, are where, where some companies stop. Large enterprises such as Barclays do not. They are comprised of many organizations. And each one of those organizations has its own definition of what success is. So how can we get enterprise help? And that's what we're looking for. The other one that we are going to delve deeply into today, and anyone who was at the previous talk will recognize this, are the quadrants. So the quadrants are our various different perspectives. And these are the ways we approach the world. We all live in all four of these quadrants, but we're not all necessarily either aware of them or have a particular affinity to them. So an example of this is, you know, you might have a scientist. And the scientist is very passionate about empirical results, things that are testable, things that you can see. So a shortcut for this is everything on the right side are things that you can see. So where I might have a feeling about something, I have, I have feelings about standing up here in front of all of you, pretty good feelings. Um, if you were to plug me into uh, an fMRI, you could actually see what those feelings, you could see the activity in my brain around what those feelings are. So internally, I've got all of this stuff going on here at the upper left. Everything that I feel on the inside 
things about my personality, things about my mood. Um, and that's kind of how I feel about me. You guys are experiencing me the way that you're experiencing me. So you're having feelings about the way I'm talking right now, about my body language, which you can see. Um, and that's, that's the, the individual aspect of this. What's happening on the inside and what's happening on the outside. Then we have our collective. So we have our relationships. So what um, we were trying to accomplish with this slide is to make this very relatable to your own experience. But if we take this a step further and we say, well, how does this apply to Agile? We might say something like, well, this is the team camaraderie. Right? This is that when the team is really humming at that beautiful level, there's something that's happening. There's a, there's a kind of a social sense of togetherness that exists. And it's palpable. You can actually experience that. Um, so that's what's taking place here at the lower left. So this is the, the, the upper left is the I. What's going on with me? The lower left is the we, this is us, this is us in this room. So our collective experience together is that lower left. Um, the upper right is the it, so the laptop that is running this, um, all of us together, um, the table. And then we have our systems. So we have Barclays, right? So Barclays has been kind enough to, to give us this room. So if we were looking at this from the perspective of um, an Agile transformation, it might be a Scrum Team's workspace. It might be the infrastructure that allows them to work well together. It might be something like Agile tooling. Um, it might be something like you know, being able to collaborate together on Confluence and have a you know, single source of record for all the knowledge that we want to keep someplace. Now again, I, I want to really caution. We're, gonna, we're going to be going through these things. Um, these are sort of simple models for very, very complex ideas. Um, so I've been personally involved in integral work for over 20 years, and I'm still learning, and I'm still being corrected by my colleagues. You know, so there's, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, but the, the, the important bit to take away from this is if you're missing if you're a scientist and you're saying, I, I, anything that I can't see, I don't believe to be true, there are things that are going to come and they're going to affect your ability to succeed. If you're, if you're a perspective, and this is, this is a perspective that is very broad in the world, that says what matters to me is that I feel right, that, I, that, I'm, that I'm attached to my purpose and I really feel like I'm achieving my goals, um, I'm, I'm less measurement oriented. My internal truth is gonna tell me whether or not I am on the right path. You're going to care less about external measurements. And you're, you might say something like, well, I don't care what the circumstances are. I don't care if our workspace is bad. Um, I'm going to provide the energy that we need to succeed. Does that make sense? I'm just going to pause and just give a, an opportunity for any questions or feedback. And the final one that, that we're going to introduce you to today are the loves. Um, you'll notice on your handouts that w there are two sets of colors. So the set of colors that we're showing are the colors. So this is a, a model called Spiral Dynamics. Um, it was originally created in 1960 by a scientist named Claire Graves. Um, and the idea behind this was to group people not by their ethnicity or their race or their religion, but to group people by the core values that really drive them. People from different areas of the world are actually more similar than they are different based on their core values. So the colors um, on your handouts, there are some different ones over on the right. So Ken Wilber, um, who you may have heard of, is one of the main proponents of integral theory. And, and he's, he's done a good portion of the heavy lifting in terms of taking things like spiral dynamics and other, and, and other um, knowledge traditions and kind of melding them into this melting pot. Um, he has a couple of different ways that he uses to describe the colors. Um, if anyone here has any experience with SAFE, you'll, you're very familiar with what Dean Leffingwell did to the epic, the Scrum epic. 
um, is now what he's calling a feature, and the Epic is all the way at the top of the portfolio. So every time I have a conversation with anybody, they go, wait a minute, what do you mean by Epic? Do you mean like an Epic from Jira, or do you mean like an Epic that's like uh, an initiative that's going to last for the whole year? So unfortunately, we have an overloading of terms. Um, this is not a new experience for any of us, but we thought it was important to include all of them. So um, working from the bottom up here, um, the instinctive layer first came about about 100,000 years ago in human history. And that was when we were basically the familial unit was what caused you to survive. You, you searched after food, water, shelter, warmth. Basically, the imperative at this level was to not die. Um, so there's, there's, if you look at your handouts, there's two ways um, to look at this. The one is how we evolved as a species, and the other is how we evolved as individuals through our own personal growth. So at this level, we're talking about generally babies up until 18 months old. They have no knowledge of anything other than how to feed themselves and how to be taken care of. Moving up from there, we go to tribal. So we have now, there's been um, a collective understanding that we are stronger as a group, but it's very driven by magical ideas. It's driven by things like, if we do this thing on this day, then maybe it'll rain. If we do this thing on this day, we listen to the tribal elders, and they're going to tell us that we have to perform this ceremony. And that started about 50,000 years ago. And actually, the, the way people started coming together is that there is a pheromone that we secrete when we eat together. So it, it largely became about the hunt. So you would hunt something. You, you hunted this large animal. Your family can't eat it by themselves. You invited some other families that you know, that don't bother you too much, and you ate together. And you started to kind of become some sort of a unit. And that's where this actually came from. Now, at some point in history, some people, maybe some big, strong people, got tired of listening to all of the tribal elders mumbo-jumbo, and they said, well, I'm strong. I can just take what you have and go forth and, and do whatever I want to do, really. Um, so that's where the red level comes into play. And um, that lasted for, for a pretty long time. It actually lasted until about 5,000 years ago. So everything that, and now we're starting to get into recorded history, right? So there's, there's a lot of um, mythology and stories that we hear about, like power gods, like Thor and Zeus, and you know, that, those are very red, they're very powerful, and they're very impressive, and strength is what, you know, is the driving force there. And then this, this blue level, and, and Ken Wilber calls it amber, um, only arrived 5,000 years ago. And it was the first time in human history where the idea of sacrificing yourself for an abstract ever came into existence. So before that, if I was going to die, if I was going to die fighting, I was going to die protecting my children or something like that, this is now I'm going to die for my nation. I'm going to die for my religion. This is an abstract idea is something where it's now greater than myself. It's the idea that there's something greater than myself that I feel like I'm a part of. Moving up from there, now we're, what you'll notice as we go up through the levels is they're going to telescope in terms of time. So the orange level only came around about 300 years ago. And that was the advent of the scientific method. It was to say, these, these various different biblical stories, as you wish, or the stories about my nation or whatever group that I'm a part of, um, those are good. However, it's important to actually test. It's important to understand the way the universe actually works. And so now we have the advent of Newtonian physics, things like that, right? Where we say, I'm going to measure this. I'm going to understand that. We've got, you know, some of the beginnings of that were um, some of our, our artists, and this, there was like a combination of art and science that was taking place at that point. We're looking now at about 200 years ago, we saw this culminate in heavy industry, steam engines, coal, that sort of thing in our history. Um, and one of the things that, and, and, and if you'll notice, the original colors, um, they go back and forth between cool colors and warm colors your blues, your greens, versus your reds and your purples. Um, the purples, and the, the warm colors, rather, they represent the collective. So every time a level is achieved, 
there's a portion of it that says, great, well, this is all well and good that the group, this is all well and good that the group believes this, but I'm strong. This is all well and good that the group believes this, but I'm going to achieve. I'm going to, I'm going to understand the way the world works, and it's going to be greater personal achievement for me. At some point, it was noticed that, wow, all of this coal and all of this heavy industry that we're doing, kind of not great for the environment, kind of not great for the world. So about 60 years ago, green started to emerge. Um, and the idea behind that is collaboration, is um, the, the ideas of the collective are more important. And it's not a collective that's based on anything anymore. It's, it's essentially anyone who's willing to come to the table and play. So everyone's opinion matters just as much as anybody else's. It doesn't matter what you've achieved. It doesn't matter what your background is. Um, one of the pitfalls, however, is, and, I, and here's something I'm sure you can all relate to, is you have a group of people. And because everybody's opinion matters just as much as anybody else's, it's very difficult to come to a decision. Trying to achieve consensus with a group of large people, you have a meeting, it feels like you've made progress, you go back, some people believe things are this way, some people believe things are that way, you go, the same group gets together, they have a meeting two weeks later, talking about the same thing. No decision was actually made because everybody's opinion is as valuable as everybody else's. But this is still a really important step because it brought um, an equality of it, it brought a different sense of values into play. And then we have second tier. So everything above um, these first six is an attempt to unite the whole spiral. So if you're on one of these first six levels, let's say, for example, you're on the orange level. If you're on one of those levels, when you're looking down at the blue level, you're judging them because you've passed through that level. And then, again, these are all invisible. So you're not like, oh, I'm orange and this person's blue. But you're like, I just the way they sound is very, it's very primitive. It's, uh, we've evolved past that. And this is, this is stupid, for, for lack of a better word. You're talking to a green person. You're like, this person's head's in the clouds. They don't know what they're talking about, right? Yeah, OK, kumbaya. I'm really, I'm really excited about everything that you have to say about you know, people should be happy, blah, blah, blah. But come on, we have work to do. I don't have time for this nonsense, right? So the, the, wherever a person happens to be, wherever their, their core of values are in these levels is very judgmental until you get to the second tier. The second tier can see the whole spiral. So they might have a feeling about it. They might say, well, I don't feel great about the thing that you just said. Maybe it hurt my feelings, or maybe it hurt somebody else's feelings. But I understand where you're coming from. And so I'm going to make an attempt to understand what your value level is. And I'm not going to communicate to you from anything above that. Because if I communicate to you from anything above that, you're going to think that I'm crazy. So I'm going to listen to how you speak. And I'm going to speak to you from your value mean, is what they call it. So an example of this might be if I'm walking into a senior leader's office, and I know that above all else, the health of their enterprise is what matters to them, I'm not going to talk to them about how good morale in teams is important and how everybody needs to feel good. I'm going to talk about these are the things that are going to make our stock price go up. These are the things that are going to make um, us be considered a great place to work. Right? I'm going to be, I'm going to have my agenda and I'm going to be achieving the objectives for the greater whole, but I'm going to speak into the listening of the person so that they actually get the message that I'm trying to get across. And it's not a manipulation because I am authentically speaking from what is going to be best for them and what's going to be best for the company. So understanding how to tune, how to listen for where people are and how to tune your message towards that is what this is all about. Okay. So now we're going to get up and we're going to have a little bit of fun. So I promised you guys that there was real life application to what we're talking about today. Um, so these are really helpful and I should have pointed that out that um, we're going to be using these today for the exercise as well as um, what's in the literature. So we are going to split you guys into four groups. Okay? So 
how are, how are you doing this right now? But a group, one group here. So this is going to be group one over here. You, I'm going to trust that you'll self-organize around whatever table feels good. One over here, two over here, three over there, and four over here. I'm going to assign each of you a number, one through four. Remember your number, OK? So the group ones will go here, twos will go here, threes will go there, fours will go here. Everyone got it? Make sense? Cool. OK. So here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We are going to assign each group to a quadrant. Okay, we just learned about the quadrants. We have quadrants on the cards. And we have an explanation of the quadrants over here. What we're going to do is, when we assign you a quadrant, we're going to give you a problem to solve. And that problem can only be assigned, uh, can only be solved from your quadrant's perspective. So the problem, only from your quadrant's perspective. Now, if you need help with what, what that means, that is why there are a few facilitators here. You've got Ben, myself, and Leor. Um, and you're going to solve it based on, again, where, where, what project you're coming from. So what's the problem? You are a new team member. Your team is already behind schedule for a client deliverable, which is due three months from now. You have not told the client yet. From your quadrant only, how would you address the problem? Now, I know we just gave you a lot of information, and some of this might be completely new to some of you, and it, it might be a little fuzzy right now. So let me give you a real life example. Um, so let's say if I were with team one, the individual, if I were to solve this problem, one thing I might say is, I am going to go in early to get more work done. <laughs> now the reason why that's in the upper left quadrant is because that motivation is not observable. That is something that is coming from my own intrinsic work ethic, my values, how I feel. I feel like I should go in work into work early to get more work done so that we can keep moving. Could you tell us, other than numbers, which quadrant you want? You're going to be... So, so group one is going to be upper left. So I in general, so your feelings. Your thoughts and feelings. Okay. Group two is going to be on the right, which is exterior exterior individual, and we'll give an example there as well. Group three is going to be lower left, right? So that's team. What can we do for the team? Group four is going to be lower right. How can I impact my environment and my systems? You will only be able to come up with things to solve the problem from that perspective. So anything that is singular and measurable. And each group, one of us is going in, and um, David is also going to help facilitate. So each group is going to have a facilitator. We know that this is, this is going to be a lot of trial and error. That's the fun aspect of this. Now here's the other thing I really encourage people to have fun with. Um, feel free to take things as far as you'd like. So don't, don't even necessarily think about um, what's reasonable or what's possible. Think of every possible solution as like anything you can imagine. So you guys were great. You are the how can how can the team how can the cohesion of the team affect our ability to deliver in that three month time frame? And it's not just deliver, right? So there's other things that are going on here. The client doesn't know what's going on, right? That's a relationship. Leaders have chosen to not tell the client what's going on. So there's, there's a lot of nuance here. There's some politics going on. Um, there, there are ways to move these boulders. So we, we want to encourage you to be as creative as possible. All right, you guys have 10 minutes. So we would have a, um, a group observable thing, which is we're gonna work behind. And why would we choose to do that? Let's okay. okay. I would I would tell the customer that they were late. Like, and my attitude was all in This was a. Yeah. Maybe we should get rid of some of our people. <laughs> 
trust, right? It's a quiet relationship, so they're not going to be surprised. So create trust. So let's go through, um, we'll start with group number one. So which two stickies do you guys want to talk through? And also, um, your, your experience of what it was like to try to solve this from one quadrant to yeah, let's start with that. What's, what's your experience? Well, I think we realized that the, this quadrant is kind of a source of, and kind of starts here and spills over to, to everything else that we do. It's kind of like a source quadrant because you know, the internal will kind of spill over to Kind of speaks to the whole ones we were talking about before and that the individual goes to a team level. So it's hard to separate them from what's happening on that level. Right. Yeah, we're a little fuzzy on um, this is not observable, but so what is not observable? Is it the motivation that's not observable, or is it the action that's not observable? So that, we debated that a little bit. Yeah, so coming in early was one that I came up with. You guys put that up there, so we're not gonna address that. But one question that came up was exercising so you feel better, so you can be a better team member. Leor? Totally, interesting, good one. Okay, and now we asked if we had the discussion. Yeah, I said, is that really internal when you're exercising. Isn't that the the right home Roger? So you're you're because it says sports even. You're observable so sports are in the upper right quadrant because they keep score. They have stats. Right? So the exercise, so what, what differentiates one athlete from another if they're similarly talented is their work ethic. It's putting in the reps. So if your idea is, I'm going to exercise so that I feel better, so that I can take on more stress, right? That's completely, that's, that's an internal, how I'm going to feel decision. <laughs> um, I'm going to pick for you guys, actually. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks a lot. Um, I really like researching better ways of doing things to be more efficient. Right. So that's giving you now internal knowledge that you can use. <laughs> All right. Automation, CI/CD, apply MVP thinking. So, so you're you're spot on with those ideas. So, how can we move the needle from? And uh, you can see the difference between something that looks like an MVP and something that looks like a market launch. Anyone else? All right. Uh, well, you you went through some of them. Um, I'll pick one more. Um, hmm. Determining how I can help the most. Anyone want to talk about? Feels a little upper lefty to me. Because your motivation is internal. How can I help the most? But so once you start talking to people, and then you explain, I want to help more, what can we do differently at that lower level? That's these guys. <laughs> so that's the point, right? So, so being introduced to these um, on first blush, I think everybody's doing an amazing job. But we have our internal team meetings where this is all we talk about and we're still struggling. So I really like want to ground for everybody that the fact that we're on the right track with these is, is already amazing. Um, you're, you'll still be doing this five years from now if this is, if this is an interesting path for you to journey towards. Um, information radiators, metrics, right? that's great. More snacks. I can see snacks, I like snacks. Update LinkedIn. Yeah, you know, uh, update your LinkedIn profile. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, update your LinkedIn profile in case everybody gets fired. To me, it came rather natural. The, I uh, 
over the Myers Briggs. I'm an ENFP, pretty extreme from all. And so to me, it's about making change. See all that that brings <laughs> <laughs> right, and that's so that, that's the point I was making earlier. So a lot of us will gravitate to where internally things make the most sense for us. So that's great that, that you're strong here. Um, you know, the idea is to get as broad as you can to um, at least liberate, it, right? So you're never if that's the way you feel about things, it's always going to way going to be the way you feel about things. So the idea is not to become balanced, but just to become literate. Did you work? Yeah, because they're, they're all spot on. <laughs> they're all a uh, pair of programming, peer reviews, take a survey to, uh, for ideas to improve, yes. Create trust with the clients so that they understand why they're, it's delayed. Um, open, com um, communication. open communication with the client, definitely. Um, make client a partner, for sure. Um, impress upon leadership time uh, to communicate with the client, yep. And a uh, team coming in early together and understanding that that is something that the team decides, and so that goes into the vibe and the culture of how the team is operating. Cool. Moving on to four. Uh, we said um, fly, fly people to the same location. Um, change the tech stack. Uh, use a physical card wall to create transparency. Any others, guys? It was my idea, so I'm going to say, buy a team that's already done it. There you go. Buy a company that's already done it. Incentivize lotuses. Incentivize lotuses? That'll work, right? You want people to, to get it right? Give them an incentive. If you take a moment to think back to the past, then you'll see, oh, that, that's what was the problem, is that you weren't taking in all four quadrants, which you all struggled with. You couldn't do it from just one place, right? So that's that's what we're trying to drive home. And if you if you hear the various different solutions that were proposed, if you were working from two, you can get something done. If you were working for three, you can get some more. But is it clear to everybody that absent the whole view, there's still something that's missing. There's something that you can succeed, and and companies are succeeding today without looking from a four project perspective. But there's still something more that we can do, and that's what we're driving at. So we're not saying there's something wrong, but we're saying there's always something more we can do. So this was um, this brings us back to the beginning of the talk. Um, how in the current agile industry are the four quadrants covered? So we should probably we'll probably just do a tally in the quadrant, I think, sure. and have people call out the practices. Things that they do from their frameworks. Yeah. All right. So we've got some uh, some examples here. In the lineup, please. Oh, uh, retrospectives, PI planning, daily standups, prioritization, automated testing, CI/CD, road mapping, etc. These are all things we're probably familiar with already from current frameworks or practices that you guys are involved in. So feel free. You can. You, we can start here. Um, and you can name your own practices, whatever you're doing today. So just call something out that um, a particular practice in the quadrant you think it belongs in. So who's doing site? Who's doing site? Who's doing less? Who's doing scrum? Right, so from, from scrum, what things, what, what things do you do? What specific things do you do and where do you think they might fit? Yeah. But just call out things and work with things for us. Retrospectives, maybe uh, top left. Top left, retrospectives. Yeah. Is lower left? I think it's lower it's left. Lower left, yes. They can be mm -hmm. popular if you go lay us out to you. <laughs> you can retrospect on your own work, but a team retrospective. That's true. Because you're deciding. Your culture, your vibe, that's usually, that's how I created my working with my team. Yep. All right. We'll just use that for the individual retrospective because we want to clear a team or individual, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe sprints. Sprints. Yeah, sprints. Could be a uh, lower, lower right. Uh, I think so. Right. Yep. <laughs> this is great. This is a fun test. He's been teaching me all this, so. All right. Metrics, upper right. Yep. So velocity. 
No. <laughs> <laughs> Not that one. <laughs> what would you put? Which, which metrics? Uh, I, I just I got a personal bias against velocity. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but, but throughput. Okay. Who does PR time? The release time. So, I'm sorry, there's a second. So are we answering this question, or are we just trying to figure out, like, I'm a little confused. So how can a transformation fail if you implement a framework without applying knowledge of the project? So how could safe fail? How could less fail? Is that what we're answering? So we're... Yeah, so we're, we're going to look at the various different... So here's an example. How many times have you heard, oh, we don't have time to do the retrospective? We're just going to keep, we're not going to waste an hour of the team's time, right? So that's, there, there's a lower left piece that's missing there. So we're going to, we, we, we're, we want you guys to come up with as many practices as you can think of, and we'll slot them where they are and see if there's weight um, in any of the quadrants. Daily stand-up, anything that's people meeting, isn't that all lower right? Maybe individual completion of a JIRA ticket would be upper, right? Yep. So, well, then that would be the same as road. Are we assuming road mapping is done by the product owner? So, I see where you're going with this, and you're making a really good point. So, you could argue that the action of road mapping is on the lower is, a, is on the lower right, but the road map is where. Where is the roadmap once you have it? On the upper right. Mm -hmm. It's an artifact that you can see. But you have it as a verb. It's true. But we're not, we're not. You didn't say roadmap. These are, these are examples. So we're not we're not beholden to this list. This was just like to get the, to prime the pump and get it going. Devil, yeah, that's great. That's great. That's great. Every devil needs an advocate. Every advocate needs a devil. Unit testing. I'm not going to give it away. We said unit testing. Where do you think? Where do you think? Upper right. Or upper left. Well, no. Yeah, upper right. I think we're upper right. Yep. All right. You can see the tests. So all, the, all, all, all the engineering practices probably would be the upper right, right? I'm not convinced because some of them may be the lower right. Automated testing might be the lower right. The automated testing structure is the lower right. The automated tests are the upper right. I'm going to just say scrum room because that one be. Anybody from the back want to join in? CACD would be lower right. CACD? Yeah. Lower right. How much longer do we want to make a point? We've got time. All right. What about the roles in Scrum? Where do those go? Roles. Are individuals doing things? But can you see the role? I'll pick up right time. You can't see a role. So a role, if it's uh, the role of a product owner, that's the um, upper left. But if it's roles and responsibilities as a whole, that's the upper right. So we can give them both a take. Sorry, lower left. You see, still, like still. <laughs> Doesn't matter how long you've been doing this, you're still going to get it wrong. You guys all out? Is that, is that all you do? You guys are doing really well, by the way. It's good stuff. Yeah. No, it, it really is. <laughs> all right, cool. OK, so um, we presumably do all of these things in response to a problem. Like we presumably do sprint planning for a reason. We presumably do CI/CD for a reason. So we have taken a bunch of elements of 
frameworks and we've said, okay, roughly, where do they sit? And we can see there's a little bit of a pattern on the board there. So we are not just constrained by what we've observed and where we've called these out and put them. We want to look a little bit more objectively. So same survey that we cited before, uh, version 1, 12th state of Agile uh, 2018. These are cited challenges uh, experienced when adopting Agile or scaling Agile. So these are the biggest problems that organizations cite to their impedance of um, the, their, their Agile transformation. So uh, I'll give you a second to read through those. Think as you read through them, think about where they sit in your quadrants, your new knowledge about quadrants. Um, can we move on? So, we took each one of those and we mapped them into a quadrant. Um, so, you can see, I don't expect you to remember the percentages on the other screen, but you can see uh, one, two, and three are lower left. So, the biggest problems people cite with their agile transformation are, looks like on the left hand side, the most artifacts and procedures and things that we use tend to be on the right hand side. So we're spending a lot of time thinking about the right hand side and we're complaining a lot about problems on the left hand side. So, so indeed, I think that the organisational culture, lower left, could have a inexperience with using agile. So yes, uh, but you could also individually have a lack of experience, so a lack of training. Um, was that a question? Okay, uh, and then we added some weight on there, simply just to say number one, two, and three are more important than number eight, nine, ten, eleven. Uh, and then when we add weight in, we can see clearly that there is a weight on the lower left and upper left and less on the right hand side. So just to ram this home for you guys, if we just one more uh, slide. If we only look at things that act on the right hand side, if we only use <coughs> a bunch of practices which manifest themselves on the right hand side, we are only likely to solve these problems with our Agile transformation. If we do not look at our left hand side, if we do not look uh, at that, then we will be missing all of those top ones and the ones interspersed. At the moment, we are disabling our ability to be successful by concentrating very heavily on frameworks and procedures and processes and artifacts. We have a big gap. Who's next? Who's going to talk about the big gap? <laughs> so there's some there's some ideas that we can have, right? So we don't we don't need to completely change the plumbing. But we could look at what are some, so a lot of the things that I say to leaders um, in, engaging in enterprise transformation is anyone who's been involved in a large scale transformation knows just about every large enterprise is somewhere on their journey in between waterfall and agile. And the unfortunate uh, circumstance that takes place there is senior leadership requires the waterfall reporting. And that is usually big decks and status reports and lots of time in meetings. But then we have all these agile artifacts and we're, we're carrying the weight of both processes. So one of the things that I encourage is look at what waterfall activities are taking place and find their agile analog and start to intersperse the agile into the waterfall and decommission the waterfall. Um, so what we're doing is we're not Part of the resistance to agile transformation is we don't have time to do this, we don't have time to do that. And, and as a coach, I say, well, the reason you don't have time to do these things is because you're wasting a lot of time doing things that are not value, uh, that are not driving value. So how can we take, how can we lean out some of the things that you're doing 
inside of the infrastructure and the meetings that are already taking place and start to bring some agility to that. So from this perspective, we're looking at it the same way. So the frameworks that exist um, are perfectly fine, right? And maybe we'll come up with some new ones and you guys will come up with some new ones and interesting things will happen. But in the interim, well, let's look at what we already have. So an idea, you know, we know the three stand-up questions. The fourth one could be, what have you learned? As an, as an example. Empower the team to decide their own KPI, right? So they're, they're being told, someone's being told, and there's, whether they're being told by, by leaders what their KPI should be, or they're being told by an agile framework what it should be, the team itself might actually internally know better what to measure so that they can improve. So it's not that we're going to stop doing these other things that are necessary to be doing, but what can we add to the process? Um, right? For upper management, implement an open door policy. Uh, a lot of times people feel really disconnected from leaders or really intimidated by them. Um, and leaders, by, by the same token, feel a sense of um, anxiety that they don't have their finger on the pulse of what's going on and they're not entirely sure the information that's being given to them is true because it keeps turning out not to be. And et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we could, we could think of, um, you know, celebration, that's a big one, right? How many times have, have we driven teams towards a deadline and then we forget to take them out to dinner and bowling or something and we just carry on? Like, just that acknowledgement is going to bring that into the lower left. And a lot of times, you know, um, the things that, that one, of the, one of the things that um, a friend of mine used to like to say, still likes to say, um, is that when you get people really inspired and engaged about what they're doing, when they feel a sense of auto autonomy, mastery, and purpose, it unlocks discretional energy inside of them where they're actually passionate about what they're doing. I mean, I, 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 I've seen you know, wide organizational retrospectives where half the people working on the product had no idea what they were building. When they would go home to their spouse or, or what have you or their friends and they'd say, what did you do today? And they're like, I don't know. I wrote some code. Right? So it's, it's, it's making that connection. It's, it's unlocking that internal passion. And then how do we as a, as a group um, make that something so that the whole is greater than some of its parts? So this brings us to the end of our talk. Um, so we just wanted to remind everybody that um, what we were looking to do here is to help you understand integral theory a little bit. Um, contrast integral theory's approach with current practices. And, and again, we looked at it from the perspective of the quadrants. So there's much more that we can go into. We can go much deeper here. Um, so I encourage you, you know, you can check out our handouts. You can Google the... Um, the idea is there. You can check out our website, which is also on there, which has some additional information. Um, and of course, we'll be available to chat with, um, not only after this course, but uh, moving forward, if you're interested in learning more. Um, and the other, the other piece of this that I wanted everyone to be able to take away was to think about how this could really impact you in your life. Because this doesn't have to be about work. I mean, clearly, we're all here from an Agile perspective. Um, but one of the things that you know, uh, I'm sure everyone can relate to is we all kind of have different personalities wherever we go. You know, we're one person when we're home with our families, and then we're one person with our friends, and we're one person when we're at work. Um, and the, the, the health of the relationships and our awareness of the different quadrants and the different things that we're doing um, are not quite the same. You know, the way we choose to take care of ourselves from a personal perspective might be lesser than or greater than the way we choose to take care of our work projects. So the idea behind all of this is how can we examine everything? How do we understand what's holding ourselves back? And how can we look to be as healthy and holistic as we possibly can be?
how do the spirals affect looking at the quadrants? Because there's really not just four quadrants here. There's four times eight. There's an upper left quadrant for the impulsive amongst us. There's a lower left quadrant for the sensitive. And depending on your organization and team's culture, you'll actually think differently in those different quadrants. So just to kind of blow this up in your heads, I won't answer that question, but I think that's actually the million dollar question that we should go home thinking about. Thank you. All right, thanks again. I really enjoyed that. I definitely learned some things myself. I'm gonna think that just mic drop last moment there. <laughs> it's also thinking about how these map to the adult uh, um, maturity levels that it, we can evolve through as well. So that's as, as well as hierarchy. The hierarchy of needs yeah. also yes, and then there's different developmental levels. So we, I, I'm, I'm not gonna start talk. Uh, <laughs> Talk to you in a second. Uh, yeah. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, so happy to have you here. Thank you again to Barclays. It was an amazing space. There's loads of pizza left, so please take some. And yes, yeah, stay around. We, we, we can be here for another little bit, maybe another 20 minutes or so. Um, so stay in the chat. And again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.